Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise you for this time that we're able to share together. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and grace. We thank you that Emmanuel has come. And he has ransomed our hearts, set us free. As we look at your word today, Father, we pray that you would speak to each and every one of us. Whatever needs we have, Father, whatever desires and aspirations, whatever fears, whatever sin, that you would challenge and convict and forgive and draw us close to you. Bless your word, Father. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of the Lord stands forever. We praise you for that, God. And my prayer is that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. It's good to see each and every one of you. Thanks for being here. A cold morning, but a warm church family. I'm glad that you're here. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. We are on the downhill slide toward Christmas, and uh, we are so looking forward to celebration today and the next couple of weeks as we move into this season. That song that we just sang before the prayer, O Come, o Come Emmanuel, is an Advent hymn from the 12th century. Uh, dates way back. And it's a hymn that describes the experience of Israel who were waiting for Messiah. And it's a powerful hymn. It's one that we understand on this side of Christmas a little bit differently. And we rejoice that Emmanuel has come. But for the Jews... It was their great longing and expectation that Messiah would one day show up and ransom captive Israel. So here's what I want to do today. I want us to take a, a, a walk in their shoes. I want us to look on the B.C. side of Christmas. And I want to ask us this question. How well do we do with waiting? I'm not talking about the kind of waiting at a stoplight or uh, at a line in a store. I'm talking about a spiritual kind of waiting where we're waiting on God, where we're praying prayers that have not yet been answered, where plans have been revealed by God but not yet realized, where promises have been made and not yet fulfilled. You see, there's a different kind of silent night. There's a silent night like the Jews experienced as they were waiting for Messiah. And one silent night turned into many silent nights and turned into years of silent nights for the Jews. A silent night is where God seems distant. A silent night is where it becomes difficult to keep Believing God's promises because circumstances are telling us otherwise. This was their experience. And so we now live on this side of Christmas. But for those before Christ, there were many silent nights. And I'd like for us to talk about that today. For us to get the true understanding of Christmas and the waiting and the spiritual waiting that experienced on that side of the nativity. And what it must have been like to have hope even against hope. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, as it's been called. And uh, the author of Hebrews goes to great lengths to describe those in the Old Testament time before Jesus who had faith and how they acted upon their faith. The very last verse of Hebrews chapter 11 talks about how all these, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Samuel, and the prophets, all these were commended... For their, for their faith, and yet had not 
seen the fulfillment of the promise. And yet they had faith. And what we see throughout the ups and downs of the Old Testament, all the failures that the nation of Israel had, we see a remnant of faith for those Jews who kept holding on when everything else said differently. When everything else said quit. When everything else said God is not here. When everything else said give up. They kept believing. And so what I want to do is I want to take a walk through some of the Old Testament and we're going to look at the similarities that we might share with them as we experience silent nights ourselves. And those places and times in our lives when circumstances are revealing to us that maybe God is not keeping his promises, that maybe God is not true to his word. And yet, we are called upon to have faith. So, we're going to look first of all at the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. And I'm going to read through several passages, and it's going to be a little hard for you to keep up. So if you want to turn, that's fine. But if you want to stay right there in Matthew 1, that's okay too. But we're going to look at several passages in the book of Isaiah. The book of, of, of uh, Isaiah is very interesting from the standpoint that it, it has this, this contrast between um, uh, the, the decay of the nation of Israel and their lack of faith and, and the destruction and how they were struggling to hold on to the belief that Messiah would come and that God would be faithful to his promises. It describes their desperate condition. They'd had a history of defeats, and now they were living with the threat of the nation of Assyria to come and conquer Judah. And yet, in the midst of that, through the prophet Isaiah, God provides words of comfort and words of trust and words of promise and, as we know, words of prophecy. No other book in the Old Testament has more prophecy regarding the coming of the Christ than the Old Testament book of Isaiah. So we read, first of all, in Isaiah chapter 7, this famous Christmas prophecy, 600 years before the birth of Christ. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and he will give, she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then in Isaiah chapter 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, in the middle of these prophecies, and in the middle of these promises, there was great struggle and great possibility for failure. And yet God is providing signs and words and promises. And I think that speaks to you and me. Because we all have times of waiting on God. Times when we've prayed prayers that have not been answered. Times when God has made promises and, and we believe the promise and yet they have yet to be fulfilled. So what is our experience? What is our experience as compared to their experience? Well, here are some reactions that we have while waiting that are very similar to the reactions, I think, even of the faithful Jew while waiting on God. The first one is hopelessness. Hopelessness. And we read in Isaiah chapter 40 through 43, and just in this snippet, this, this segment of this Old Testament book, we, we read prophecy after prophecy, and in the middle of those prophecies, we see the needs of the people of Israel. You say, well, how do you know that these are needs? Because the Messiah would answer these needs. And so we read these certain passages in Isaiah and we see, hey, this is what the Messiah is going to remedy when he comes. And so let me try to read through these real quickly. Isaiah 40, 1 through 5 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her, all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for her God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill be made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Comfort, comfort my people, because Messiah is coming. Make straight 
away for the Lord. You ever get hopeless when waiting on God? Kind of tired of waiting? God brings words of comfort in times like that. Secondly, weariness. In Isaiah 40, the end of chapter 40 through chapter 41, the beginning of chapter 41, this famous passage is given in the context of Messiah coming. They were weary, and this is what God says through the prophet to the nation of Israel. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. The creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And now in chapter 41, verse 1, Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. And here's the Messiah. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? In verse 2 of chapter 41, is a sign, is a prophecy, concerning that one who will eventually come from the east when Christ returns, there to return on the east side of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. He will come in righteousness. Again, a word to give strength in the middle of their weariness. Next, injustice. Injustice. In times of waiting on God, we have this sense, God, you're not being fair to me. And we compare ourselves to other people, maybe even evil people, people who are doing wrong. And we say, God, look at what they're doing and look at how they are blessed and look at how they're being taken care of. And you can imagine the nation of Israel, God, we're your promised children. And yet we see all around us threats and destruction. And so there's a sense of injustice that is often ours in times of waiting. In Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, he addresses that with the nation of Israel. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his law, the islands, those who are isolated, put their hope. Messiah will come and make everything right. In this world of unfairness, In this world where you're waiting and you see other people being blessed and things going right for them. In this world where you have those kinds of experiences. Listen, God will be faithful. He will make things right in time. Trust, hope in the Lord. And then the other thing. How we react with respect to waiting on God is we want to retreat to the past. Retreat to the past. In Isaiah 43, verses 15 through 19. The word of the Lord through Isaiah says this. And and he constantly reminds them of this. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, And they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Now, the writer here is going to great detail to describe an experience in Israel's past. What was that experience? The crossing of the Red Sea, right? That time where Moses raised the staff, and the sea parted, and the Israelites walked through the Red Sea on dry land, and the Egyptians followed them into the sea, and God closed the sea upon them, and as the word says, extinguished them, snuffed them out like a wick. This was the greatest miracle in Israel's history. It was the premier event. 
And so the writer is describing this event in great detail. I'm the one who did that, he says. But then in Isaiah 43, 18, it says this. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Now it's happening. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? What a wonderful insight for those of us who are waiting on God. For those of us who are trying to hold on to hope. What a wonderful insight. Isn't it our instinct to want to retreat back to the past? Certainly this was true of the Israelites that got out in the desert with Moses. He said, we should have stayed back in Egypt. It was better back then. This is our instinct. We want to go back to what was secure and comfortable. And yet when we're in between, and many of us find ourselves in those places. In between, in between, in between, in between the prayer and the answer to the prayer, in between the promise and the fulfillment, in between the plan being revealed and the plan being achieved. We're just in between. And we become tired. And we become weary. We become hopeless. And our instinct is to go backwards, to move to what was most comfortable. And so here I can imagine the people of Israel in the context of Isaiah with the threat of Assyria breathing down their necks saying, oh, if we could just go back to those days. Oh, if we only had a Moses to lead us again. Oh, if we could just go back. And it isn't amazing how the very good things in our past can keep us from achieving And seeing the better things in our present come to pass. And how those often rob us even of the future. The good things that we've experienced in the past. Can keep you and me from the future that God has for us. Because why? Because we want to tie ourselves to the way that God did things back then. And yet the word of the Lord to them. The word of the Lord to us. Don't retreat. Don't go backwards. I'm doing a new thing. Do you not see it? It's springing up even now. I'm working even now. Hold on. Don't quit. Don't give up. It's going to happen in time. Don't give up on God. Don't stop waiting. So these words were given 600 years before the birth of Christ. And generation would come and go, holding on to the promise. And as Hebrews 11 say, many of them remained faithful. Many of them didn't lose hope. Many of them were renewed in their strength. And they flew as eagles in the midst of circumstances around them that were depressing. And circumstances where they could lose hope. Yet they held on to God. And ultimately that promise would come to pass. It's what we celebrate at Christmas. God came through on his promise. Promise made, promise kept. And we read about it in Matthew chapter 1. And you read this and you say, well, that's a great part of the Christmas story. But when you bring hundreds of years, hundreds of prophecies to this moment in history where there, Joseph and Mary were instructed by an angel to hope and to wait that this is of God, it brings so much more meaning to the experience. Because here they were Jews that were also waiting for Messiah. And yet they would be blessed to see it come to pass in their life. And so in Matthew chapter 1 verses 21 through 23. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Which prophet is that? Isaiah. The virgin will be with child 
and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the reminder, 600 to 700 years before, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, was that God will be with you, not in the form of Jesus, but that God is with you. Hold on. Hold on. So, here's the question. It's a question for them. It's a question for us today. Does God keep his promises? It's an honest question that we all have in our lives. At some point in time in our lives, we all have that very, very honest question. And what I want to do today is to remind you and to remind me, yes, God does keep every one of of his promises, but there's some things that we need to understand. And the message of Christmas is the reminder about God's promises and the way that we need to understand God's promises. So on silent nights, in silent nights, we need to remember some things. Just like the nation of Israel needed to remember in their silent nights, when we have those silent nights where God seems distant, we need to remember some things. We need to remember, first of all, that while God's promises are certain, our our participation in them is conditional. While God's promises are certain, our participation in them is conditional. You say, well, what do you mean by that? This is what I mean. God gives promises. They're all recorded here in the Scripture. He provides truth to you and me. He provides promises time after time after time. But God's promises, listen to this, you've got to get this. God's promises are not formulas for us to get what we want when we want it. God's promises are opportunities for faith. God's promises are opportunities for trust. They're not given to us so that we can have certainty. Not in that sense. God's promises are certain. They will come to pass, but our participation in them is conditional. Because why? Because they are opportunities for you and me to trust God at his promises. This is really the context of the whole Isaiah 7 passage anyway. And that great verse, a a virgin will be with child and she will bear a son and they will call him Emmanuel. The whole context of that passage in Isaiah 7 is a king of Judah who didn't believe God. His name was Ahaz. And God told him with the threat of Assyria, God said to him through the prophet Isaiah, listen, trust me, have hope in me, don't give up on me. And Ahaz chose the other direction. And so God gave a sign, but Ahaz did not participate in it. Ahaz would never see that come about because he had already made a pact with a neighboring nation. And instead of trusting in God in the middle of that crisis, he chose to go his own way. So you and I can know about God's promises without experiencing them. You say, why? Because when we don't trust God in his promises... We don't experience his promises in our lives. They are opportunities for faith. They are opportunities for fulfillment. So based upon our trust and based upon our obedience, in between the promise and the fulfillment, we then experience, ultimately, God's promises coming true, coming to pass in our lives. You want to experience God's promises. Don't just believe them. Trust them. Trust them. Secondly, in times of silent night, remember that in God's promises, His delay is not His denial. Again, if these are opportunities for faith, which they always are, There is a gap between when the promise is made and when that promise is fulfilled. And so God's delay in fulfilling his promise is not always his denial, and we think it is. We think because we don't see God's hand at work that he must not be at work. 
we think because we don't witness God's activity in that in-between time that we think that He's not being active. And yet the truth of the Scripture is that He is. And He was for the nation of Israel. He was acting on their behalf, but they couldn't see it. And they chose to walk in disobedience. There's one word that all kids hate to hear at Christmas time, and that's the word wait. And, uh, you know, wait till Christmas, and we hate to hear it too. And again, when we don't see God at work, we think he's not working. Therefore, we have a hard time believing that his promise remains. And yet he is. If you were to ask my kids to build a case upon the fact that I existed based upon if I will do what they want when they want me to do it, I don't exist. Are you building a case of God's love and presence in your life only because he's not doing what you want when you want him to do it? That's not faith. That's not trust. God is working. He is faithful to work. Inherent in the promise is a trust that you and I must have in the fact that he is working. And though there is this gap of time and this gap of circumstance, there's this time period of waiting, we must believe and trust that God truly is still working. And then the third thing that I think we need to remember on those silent nights is we need to remember that in between the promise and the fulfillment, God gives specific words to help. Specific words to help and a specific word to help. It was true for the nation of Israel. It is true for you and me. Splattered all throughout the book of Isaiah are words of strength, words of comfort, words of trust, words of reminders that God is still in control. They were all throughout those centuries. Some believed, some chose not to. In our lives, when we're experiencing times where we don't see the fulfillment of God's promises, we do have one thing, we do have something, and that is His words. Specific instructions given to you and me about what we're to do. You say, well, I'm waiting on God. What am I to do? Well, wait on God. (laughs) Build faith. Build trust. And find now in Him strength, comfort, and trust that He wanted to create all the way along. You see, it's not so much about the promise being fulfilled as much as it is about you and me through the process of that promise being fulfilled, learning that our God truly is faithful, that we can have hope in Him, and we can have trust in Him. And if the message of Christmas is anything, it's a message as we look back to the time before Christ, where we see the remnant, where we see the faith of those Jews who waited and waited and waited, and yet were faithful. And we say to ourselves, in my life, I can do the same thing. I mean, I have have Christ. I mean, I'm on this side of Christmas. How much more should I be reassured that God keeps his promises? How much more should I be reassured that there is strength and hope by turning to him? You know, in one sense, in one sense, you and I, in a general broad sense, you and I are kind of in that in-between. We are in that in-between. We have experienced here 2,000 years before today, we have experienced the first coming of Christ. And what a wondrous coming it was. Where he was born, he lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. And he was resurrected in power and glory. But when he left, he said, I'm coming back. And we are in between the promise. The promise of when he came the first time and the fulfillment of him coming 
back again. And so, in a sense, we are on a journey. We are on a journey, just like the Jews were, just like the nation. We are on a journey where we are waiting for Messiah to come in the form of his dissension from heaven to earth, again, to take his people as his bride and to establish his kingdom here on this earth and to judge evil once and for all. It's going to come. And so in your days, even now, your days of hopelessness and weariness, your days where you feel like the world is just unfair and unjust, your temptations to move back to the past rather than forward in your faith, God says, hold on. Don't give up. And remember through the Christ child in his first coming, remember he's coming again. And we can walk in faith because of the words that God has given to each and every one of us during that in-between. Let's find that hope and that faith and that strength at Christmas. If you're experiencing a silent night, if you're at a point in time in your life where God seems distant or prayers are cold and it's hard to understand, hold on is the message. Don't give up. Wait on God. He will keep every one of his promises. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you that right in the middle of our silent nights we remember that a baby was born who was Emmanuel who was God with us and so Father create in us the kind of faith that goes beyond the circumstances goes beyond uh, our faith flighty feelings our emotions give us the kind of faith Lord that allows us to put true hope and trust in you particularly in times of in between grow us up Father Help us to walk this path that you have for each and every one of us with great expectation and great longing for that day when Jesus will come again. Father, for those who are struggling this morning, just sense in my heart that they're here minister bring comfort and peace and hope we pray these things in Jesus name